So today we're going to be uh, joined uh, by Christopher Glaze, our principal research scientist, our CEO and co-founder Alex Ratner, and Marty Moesta, our lead product manager uh, on our Gen AI. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to each of you. Uh, share maybe just a little bit about yourself with the audience. Uh, sure. Uh, Chris Glaze, my principal research scientist. I've been in, uh, at Storkel for about two years. And over the past year, I've been leading the company and expanding its weak supervision uh, paradigm to include generative AI. Hey, Alex, uh, one of the co-founders and CEO here at Snorkel. Um, also get to uh, co-advise some, some great students at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, before Snorkel was was helping to lead the Snorkel project at uh, uh, at the Stanford AI Lab. Um, all around, you know, over the last decade, really uh, data labeling and data development for AI, or as Chris mentioned, the uh, the other nerdier technical phrase of weak supervision, but really using more efficient and programmatic techniques for all of the labeling and preparation of data that goes into tuning all parts of an AI system, including the retrieval components, which we'll talk about today. Hey, everybody. I'm Marty. I've been at Snorkel just under three years now, and I lead our product efforts around development workflows for generative AI. Let's focus on three items in particular, evaluation and development workflows to tune RAG systems and LLMs. And I'm excited to demo a couple of these capabilities later today in the webinar. Uh, just a quick agenda. We'll be covering uh, a quick intro with Alex. Uh, then Chris is going to dive into RAG optimization. Uh, Marty will be doing live demos. And then we'll be uh, joined back by Alex and taking that live Q&A towards the end. So go ahead and move forward. And we'll hand it over to Alex. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you, John. And most importantly, thank you to everyone who's joining today. We're very uh, honored that you are joining us here. And we really want to make this session informative to you. And obviously, you know, a lot of what we share uh, will be overlaid with our perspective on what we call data-centric AI and the importance of data as uh, you know, key fuel for optimizing all parts of an AI system, including the retrieval components. And we'll show some of how we're materializing that perspective in our uh, you know, approaches and our product. But obviously, we want the output here to be you know, generalized uh, learnings around uh, you know, our perspective on how RAG uh, and retrieval in general for AI is, uh, is, is actually productionized. This is a big title, Future of AI. Um, I'm gonna disappoint a little bit. I'll keep this a little bit you know, closer to home with just a couple of starting thoughts on what we're gonna talk about in the webinar today around retrieval for uh, AI systems and you know, what's often referred to as RAG or retrieval augmented generation specifically. So I'll start with just a kind of simple um, simple metaphor that at least for me is kind of helpful uh, in thinking about how the different pieces of an AI system that has some retrieval component fit together. And you know, we're going to zoom in on retrieval specifically in the rest of this webinar, but I think it's helpful to kind of um, just take a step back and look at the bigger picture for a second. I think one of the most... Um, you know, common misconceptions around retrieval or RAG is this idea that it is an alternative to, or it's an adversary to the notion of fine tuning or alignment or other tools for using data to improve uh, AI systems. In fact, a lot of probably what's gonna be unique in our perspective, although not at all unprecedented in the academic literature or in, in years of work around information retrieval systems, I'll note, but a lot of what might be new in terms of you know, what we're sharing relative to the AI dialogue is actually how you can use data and use fine tuning to improve retrieval systems and in turn use retrieval systems alongside uh, 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 things like fine tuning. I like to think about um, off the shelf large language models as kind of like, um, uh, you know, think think about them as a like a college student or or a new medical student, and we're trying to get that medical student to work in a real production setting to let's say go diagnose a, a complex cancer patient. Part of doing that is giving them access to the right information, to the patient's chart, to the medical literature. Even an expert oncologist can't diagnose that patient if they don't have that data access, that that ability to retrieve information. That's kind of like retrieval or RAG. Now, also, you know, even with the access to the patient's chart and all the relevant data, an untrained medical student is not going to be able to make accurate decisions around an oncology patient. They still need training. They need training about general decision making, and actually they need training about how to retrieve information accurately 
if anyone's ever looked at the medical literature, it's 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 a nightmare of of, of jargon, um, and that goes with most subdomains. So, in fact, um, this med student still needs training on both how to reason and and even how to retrieve, and that's a metaphor for fine tuning LLMs and actually fine tuning retrieval systems. We'll get into. So I think about the AI space as having a bunch of tools that are actually very complementary. You know, there's tools for giving better access to data, ex to external data and context to the AI model. That's you know what we're going to talk about today with retrieval. There are tools for improving how the model makes decisions. That's you know something like fine tuning, and they all work together. Okay, now as we zoom in on retrieval specifically. Worth saying a couple of words, especially given the, the the prompt of the slide, which is future of AI, about where we think a lot of this is heading. And I'll note that just as a company, we're a, a data labeling and development platform that we make it programmatic like software development. But we basically, you know, are a platform for helping you label and develop and tag data for all sorts of use cases, not just RAG or retrieval. So, as much as we're incredibly excited and invested in retrieval and RAG. You know, this is one of many things that we support. So we we kind of have a neutral perspective here. What I'd say is that, you know, our view though is that re retrieval and this kind of rag paradigm is going to be pretty robust, although it's going to change. Even now, we see a lot of exciting progress around um, uh, large language models with bigger context windows or bigger prompts, um, like Gemini, for example, uh, from our partners over at Google. Um, long context windows models, as they're called, uh, you know, including or especially as we we start to see post transformer model architectures, uh, which you know uh, we've also done work on on the academic side. You know, as we see them, you know, start to 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 get out more. Uh, we think long context windows are going to get you know bigger and cheaper, and they're definitely going to be another tool in the toolkit that is that is critical to consider but we also do think that rag is going to be a robust staple of the L, you know modern the, you know the present and future llm system architecture why i mean some very simple reasons uh, you know getting an ai system to work is not just about you know ease of use and and even not just about accuracy it's also about cost latency and modularity especially as these systems move to production you know, that's one reason, one very basic reason of why, you know, a RAG system is going to, we think, be a robust staple. People are not going to want to just dump everything into a giant model, especially ones where the context window and the tuning of it are finicky. They're going to want to break it apart into modular pieces that are cheaper and faster. Again, we're neutral, so you know our perspective, whether we're being used to label data to tune uh, and develop long context window models as we're doing some work around um, uh, uh, or rather supporting customers who are using uh, uh, our platform there or tuning RAG systems, kind of the same to us. But we think uh, that RAG is going to be very robust. Again, latency, act, you know, latency, cost, and modularity will be a big reason. And then also just, you know, there will be many settings where, um, you know, you're not just trying to dump in a single document. You're doing retrieval and say question answering or summarization or reasoning over a massive corpus. And uh, long context window models won't be the solution there, even if you have infinite budget um, and are fine with the, the latency and modularity trade-offs. So that's a little bit of kind of the future. We think, you know, retrieval and retrieval augmented generation is going to, you know, change as long context window models and other techniques get out there. But we think it's going to be uh, a robust and central part of the LLM system architecture. Okay. So how do we get it to work? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And I'll just give a brief preview of how we think about it and then turn it over to, to Chris to dive in. Um, I'll note though, that at a high level, getting retrieval systems to work, A, is not trivial, meaning it doesn't just work out of the box. And B, it's actually an area where people have studied for uh, you know, and 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 built concepts for uh, for decades um, under the you know the usual name of information retrieval. It's a whole field of study. So there's actually a lot of stuff that we're sharing here. It's not uh, uh, re you know it's not inventing the wheel for the first time. It's actually building on very old and classical concepts that a lot of AI Twitter may have forgotten, but that are actually you know very well founded. On the first point, you know, goes back to the metaphor I started with of. You know, think about an out-of-the-box LLM system, including the retrieval system, as kind of that med student. Step one is give them access to the medical literature, to the patient's chart, et cetera. 
but they still need training on how to search the medical literature, on what terms to use, on how to read a patient's chart. In other words, uh, retrieval systems still need to be tuned for the areas they're working in. Many of our customers are seeing that some of the biggest error modes in their systems, you know, think Q&A systems um, over, over you know, domain-specific corpora, some of the biggest error modes are in the retrieval step where the you know, out-of-the-box embeddings, retrieval, re-ranker models, you know, basically the out-of-the-box RAG system is not able to parse these domain-specific documents or, 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 or content. So, and, and the last thing to say there quickly is actually, if you go back to the original paper that coined the term RAG um, from some of our friends over at Stanford, their quote-unquote dumb baseline was um, uh, actually just the out-of-the-box models. And the whole paper was about fine-tuning RAG systems. So this concept that you know RAG doesn't just work out-of-the-box with out-of-the-box embeddings, out-of-the-box configurations, et cetera, is literally in the original RAG paper. And it's quite intuitive, at least if you think about it in the way that I laid out. Okay, so last thing, you know, how do we actually go and get RAG to work in custom settings? This will just be a quick preview and then Chris is, and Marty will dive in. So we think about it in kind of three uh, buckets. One is chunking. So many of you who are practitioners of retrieval and RAG systems, um, you know, understand that you know chunking basically splitting up you know documents and corpora into smaller bite-sized pieces that can be retrieved by the system and fed into the context of an LM is one of the the tricky and finicky parts of of getting the system like this to work and we'll talk a little bit about you know more advanced and custom ways to do that strategy number 2 is actually tuning or fine tuning the rag system and again, going back to that that med student metaphor, this is basically, you know, teaching the med student of how to search the medical literature, what domain specific terms to use, how to read the patient's chart. Um, what does this actually boil down to? Usually, it's using labeled data to tune either the embeddings or the retrieval or re-ranker model to perform well on the specific type of data, domain, and use case at hand. And number three, we're seeing an increasing amount of activity around. Uh, tagging and uh, and 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 labeling and indexing the data. In other words, not everything has to be or should be a vectorized embedding. Often it makes a lot of sense to go through and basically pre-index your data by tagging and labeling it and just search over that in addition to the vectorized form. All of these concepts, again, by the way, are really classical ones that have root in you know the decades old field of information retrieval. So I'd encourage all of you, if you get really jazzed up about this topic, to go build, you know, buy an IR textbook and, and see that what we're saying is not new in many ways. It's building on old concepts, but obviously translating them into some pretty cool new techniques and tech for these new approaches. So without further ado, I'm going to pause there and uh, kick it over to Chris to get into the details of those three major approaches to tuning and productionizing RAG systems. Thanks, Alex. And um, really well said. So <clears throat> indeed, I'm going to talk about RAG optimization or fine tuning. And what I'm going to do is, is give a basic overview of that process, um, how we approach it at Snorkel. And I'll really be kind of teeing up uh, what Marty's going to unpack for you very concretely with a demo of how that works. So I, what I can tell you is I'll give you the concepts, some examples, and then you'll actually see it in action. So it's not just abstract. RAG stands for Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, as Alex mentioned, this is not a, a new concept. Uh, it's uh, actually several years old. The, the, coin was, the coin was ter term was coined about several years ago, pre-GPT-3. Um, the idea was to address limitations of AI uh, when AI needs access to an external knowledge source. How do you get the pieces of that knowledge source that are relevant to the AI's task? Um, and those limitations still exist today, um, even with large context window models, as, as Alex mentioned. So we see RAG is remaining relevant, or really the retrieval piece of RAG is being relevant. <clears throat> if that knowledge source is too big to fit into the context window, that's still true even with large context windows today, um, especially if you have you know, huge document repo with thousands of documents are very long. You might not even be able to fit that within some of the largest context windows that we see right now. Um, but importantly, it's also really relevant um, when that context window or the knowledge source contains a lot of distractors. There may be cases where there's low hanging fruit that you can kind of pick off, you know, filter out 
Uh, maybe you have a huge document repo and you know that only a few are going to be relevant to any given AI task. Why give it the entire document repo every single time? Why not filter out the ones you know will be irrelevant and only allow it to focus on the ones that will be relevant? Um, so th those are the kinds of use cases in which a RAG is still relevant, even with long context window models. And what I'm showing you down here is just a cartoon version that I'm going to unpack in a little bit. Um, those of you who are already familiar with the basic RAG, I've probably seen something like this already, where you have unstructured documents, you divide them up into chunks, you feed that to a retrieval model that usually involves embeddings, and then you take that retrieved context along with the prompt for the AI task, concatenate it, feed it to the large language model to then generate a response. Um, often that's kind of question answering kind of tasks, but it's not just question answering. So I'm gonna unpack this in a more granular view now, because this is how we view RAG and how we've been approaching this with, with our customers. We, we have documents that indeed we have to chunk, as I mentioned before, but as Alex mentioned, um, we've actually found uh, across customer use cases that it's also useful to use some of these more traditional techniques where you take these documents in these chunks and, and you tag them, um, you, you know, classify the document, pick out pieces of information like tables, tag them as tables, if you know there'll be tasks related to tables. And then what we do is we take that, the whole set of documents, chunks, and metadata that we've created, feed that to our embedding model and our retrieval model. Um, and then it's really this enriched information plus the embeddings that we feed to the context window for the large language model. Um, and so what I'm gonna do over the next few minutes is I'll drive home two take-home messages and, and, and focus on key parts of that pipeline. So take-home message one is that the whole pipeline matters. Every piece of that process is really critical for, for a fine-tuned RAG system for it to work. And it's really important to be able to optimize each of those components for your, your separate use case. So um, let's zero or uh, home in on some of these, these components that we've seen to be especially important for optimization and customer use cases. Um, I'm talk I'll talk about how we split up the documents, convert them to chunks. I'll touch on a little bit about creating this metadata so it's not just abstract. I'm going to spend a few minutes on embeddings and how we fine tune retrieval models. Um, there's going to be the pieces I'll focus on today, and uh, you'll see it in action in Marty's demo. Um, all of this pipeline is relevant, but what I'm highlighting here are the pieces that that we think are uh, really critical and, and the value that we bring as a company to, to customer use cases and helping the fine tuning process. So let's begin with splitting and chunking documents. You can think of a document chunk as kind of a basic unit of information that's retrieved and passed to a large language model. And it's important to make sure that we're, we're really using the right units. You know, what is a unit of information? Is it a sentence? Is it a word? Is it a whole paragraph? Um, you know, if, if the unit is too big, you run the risk of including too much signal for the large language model. If your basic unit is a whole document, you run the risk of um, really burdening the large language model of interpreting the entire document to answer a question, for example, that may just involve one or two paragraphs. Um, and it may get thrown off, go down a garden path. If there are other paragraphs that may, may look like the ones that are relevant, uh, but may cause it to hallucinate because it, it contains information that actually isn't relevant. Um, if your units are too small, you run the risk of leaving out too much context. For example, if you take your document and you just split it into a bunch of different sentences, um, you run the risk of you know, really giving your large language model kind of a word salad in which each individual sentence doesn't really make sense if the context isn't there for the large language model to understand that sentence. Uh, how do we actually define these optimal units? You can think of two basic approaches. One is fixed. So you can define a unit as kind of a fixed window same number of tokens um, in every chunk. That's often what you see in these APIs um, in which you do RAG kind of off the shelf. You know, you have a window, for example, 500 tokens, divide up the document, the even 500 token chunks. Um, there are also dynamic approaches uh, that are kind of sensitive to, to the content of that document. So that's what we call like a dynamic chunking algorithm. If it's kind of physical, you may use basic features uh, like paragraph information, you know, headers. If it's what we call semantic, you actually may try and interpret um, the, the document on a semantic level and really divide it with respect to topics. And uh, we actually have an adaptive algorithm that the research team has been working on that, that's both dynamic and semantic. And that's one that we've, uh, we're have we seeing in our experiments and some of our customer use cases is actually the most powerful. So I'm actually gonna go into a little more detail on that one because I think it's gonna highlight the importance of chunking and getting it right. Um, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, I'll, I'll talk about in a minute, but it's, it's from an experiment that we've run. Um, the, the basic idea is that we take, we take a document 
and we kind of naturally carve it up at the joint. So if you have a document that has multiple topics in it, let's treat our basic unit as kind of that topic. So instead of paragraphs, it could be you know sets of paragraphs that are related to that topic. Um, and we, we found is that when we divide up documents in this way, we get dramatically improvement, dramatic improvements in the question answering ability of large language models, about, about 20 to 30 points in Lyft on uh, three different question answering tasks when you compare it with just paragraph based chunking. Um, 10 to 20 points in Lyft when you compare it with an alternative semantic chunking algorithm offered by the Llama Index uh, API. And what I'm showing you here on the right hand side is just an example of a result from our experiment. So what, what I'm showing you here on the horizontal axis is, is sentence position. So you take a document, you index it by sentence. Um, this blue line is just a piece of an embedding space. And I'll talk about embedding spaces in a little bit, but it's just showing how there, there are changes in the embedding space that represent changes from topic to topic. And these red lines are kind of a ground truth notion of where we should optimally demarcate these chunks. And what I've done here is I've taken newspaper articles that are somewhat similar in theme, they're all newspaper articles, but very different in terms of topics. And as you can hopefully see with these green lines where we've inferred the optimal way of dividing up this series of newspaper articles, our algorithm can naturally divide it up at the, at the right unit. So this was a case in which we had an article about Canadian broadcasting system, transitioning to an album review, then a book review. These are obviously very different kinds of information that we wanna divide up and treat separately our algorithm is able to kind of discover those boundaries naturally. Just another example to help you know nail this down for you all. So it's not just abstract. You know, I gave you a representation from an embedding space. Here's a real document. And on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you an example where we've used a default in many RAG APIs where we have a fixed window size. As you can hopefully see on the left-hand side, if we use this fixed window side, we're really decimating some important contextual cues. Like for example, uh, if you ask a large language model that requires this whole table here, you end up feeding it pieces of this table and you run the risk of really um, giving it chunks that don't have a proper context to really answer the question. Whereas on the right-hand side, this is a representation of what al our algorithm can do, where you're more naturally chunking this document um, at natural boundaries. You know, you get the whole table. And if you ask the uh, large language model a question that requires access to this table, it gets it in one whole chunk. So it has all the context it needs to answer that question. So let's we'll leave it there for now. Let, let's just move on into the pipeline. Metadata, how do we extract metadata? Why is it, why is it valuable? We've seen metadata be really useful, uh, really in two, in two respects. One is that you can actually leverage metadata to help create a training set for your retrieval model. So just taking um, the, the document example I showed you before, you know, if, if you're able to take that chunk and tag it as a table, you actually create training sets of other tables that might be in that document and have a training algorithm that really teaches a large language model how to optimally answer questions that require access to tables. So there's no reason to just have a, a more sophisticated AI algorithm naturally discover this table if we can more easily define it uh, with a more traditional information extraction approach, which is one of the uh, approaches that we use at the company. You can also use metadata directly in the retrieval process. And actually, um, Alex alluded to this before, you know, suppose you have a retrieval uh, algorithm that's very sophisticated, can, you know, get topics that we know are going to be relevant to a specific task. Well, if we know all beforehand, pre-retrieval, what's a table and what isn't, and these questions all related to tables, then there's no reason why you can't just pull out those tables before even giving it to the retrieval model and just concatenating it in with all the proper context. So in other words, use what works. And if we know that their tables are relevant to the task, you should just pull out tables if they're tagged as such. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, I'll just go over two basic approaches and, um, that, that we use at the company. Uh, we use information extractors and where you break a uh, document apart, you use these chunks and you tag chunks with key pieces of information, such as is it or is it not a table? Maybe, you know, we're interested in dates, you know, date extractors. Um, we're also building classification models and we can take whole documents and classify them. Maybe you have a whole document repo and um, if you have documents related to the medical sciences, you know, it's really important to know which are devoted to, you know, specific kind of medical sciences like cancer, uh, you know, versus diabetes. If you have a question related to cancer, pull out all the documents classified as cancer before feeding it to the model. Just, you know, again, breaking this down, showing you an example from a PDF. You know, again, classification model applies to the whole document. Um, you know, you could, this one will just classify as research. 
Um, we could tag it with different topics. You know, this one happens to be related to gener generative AI, large language models, information extractors that we build usually apply to the chunks, kind of the subcomponents of the document that we think might be relevant if, if we need a more granular view for the large language model. Moving on to the embeddings and the retrieval model, I'm gonna group these together and you'll, you'll see why in a minute. So what I'm showing you here is, is really a more holistic diagram of the retrieval model and the, the role that embeddings may uh, play. Um, there are actually alternative ways of performing retrieval. So I'm just showing you one way uh, purposely because it's one of the simplest ways. The idea is that you have a prompt to a large language model. You already have your chunks. You feed them both to an embedding model that essentially turns them into strings of our series of numbers. You know, we'll call that a prompt embedding and a chunk embedding. And then what you can do is take those two embeddings and compute relevance scores for each chunk. And it's really just a similarity score. So for each chunk embedding, you can say, well, how similar is this or how relevant is it to the prompt? You can score that on a scale of zero to one. And the ones that you think are most relevant are the ones that you then feed to the large language model. So you can almost think of it as a scoring mechanism that allows you to filter out all the distractors that I mentioned at the beginning. And so really importantly, the quality of your embeddings really drive the quality of a retrieval model. Um, if your embeddings group together, you know, chunks that are relevant, chunks that are irrelevant, you're actually going to have a really poor retrieval mechanism because it's not going to know how to score them properly. I'll go into that actually in, 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 over the next few slides. Um, so again, why is this important? They're used to score models and how relevant they are. Pre-trained embedding models we found often for uh, domain-specific use cases lump together relevant and irrelevant chunks for a given task. And so it's important to really be able to fine-tune them to be more granular and kind of separate out chunks that are relevant from chunks that are irrelevant for each task. But how do we do this? Um, what, what we do is historical. We have a, a fairly methodical process in which we first, we choose the right kind of pre-trained embedding model. We use something called the MTEB benchmark that you can find on Hugging Face. Um, we usually will pick one that we think is going to map best to the customer use case, depending on the kind of task it is, perhaps a domain. Then we baseline the ability of that pre-trained embedding model to perform well in our retrieval uh, method saying how good is it already at distinguishing relevant from irrelevant chunks. And then we fine tune it to better distinguish those kinds of chunks. Let's talk about the baselining just for a minute. And I'll explain this plot on the right, because it's really going to help right from the point of, of what fine tuning can do to you, uh, do for you. So uh, again, you know, we want to select a suitable base. We kind of pre-trained model that performs good enough on public benchmarks. Um, what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, though, is what we obtain from baseline the solution. So uh, on the x-axis, what we have are these relevance scores that I, that I mentioned, these scalars, these numbers from zero to one that tell you how relevant a given chunk is to a given task. As it, and on the y-axis, just the count of prompt chunk pairs. And so these are, these are basically uh, histograms. And as you can hopefully see, there's a lot of overlap here from the pre trained model. The orange are chunks that are relevant to a given task. The blue are ones that are irrelevant. Um, and, and as you can hopefully see, the scoring mechanism here doesn't do a very good job at separating them out. You know, being having a high score above 0.5 gives you almost no information about whether something is relevant or not. Um, and in fact, there really is no good scoring threshold here that would tell you how to make a decision about whether to include a chunk. So if something needs to change. We need to fine tune the embedding model to the use case and the domain under, under question. So how do we do this? Again, you know, Alex alluded to this. Uh, we found that data development is really key to this kind of fine tuning process. Um, and, and so what I'm showing you in the right hand side here are three components that we use for the training set we, that we develop for fine tuning. The top and the bottom are actually fairly standard. The one in the middle is one that we've innovated at the company. So I'll actually describe that last. The first one, manually labeled prompt and chunk pairs. These are ones in which a subject matter expert would go in and just give you a chunk question, tell you whether it's relevant or not, kind of manual annotation of ground truth. And importantly, what they'll tell you is not just examples of, of prompts and chunks that are relevant, but also chunks that are irrelevant. Cause you wanna give your fine tuning algorithm negative examples and like, you know, not just what to lump together, but what to you know, divide up in your embedding space. Now, manual data collection is, is laborious. Subject matter experts are really expensive. You want them to go through and, and create thousands of examples. They make hundreds of dollars an hour, often um, just not feasible. Me, maybe using the to evaluate, but you don't want them to sit down and create your training set for you. On the bottom here is, is another kind in which we have synthetic prompt and chunk pairs. I'll describe that in the next slide a little bit more. Um, in the middle, 
um, programmatically labeled prompt and chunk pairs are ones in which you can actually use your subject matter experts and scalably create uh, a prompt and chunk pair data set um, in, in a way that captures some of their intuitions. So I'll unpack these a little more before moving on to the actual fine tuning process. You know, as I mentioned, mainly uh, created label uh, prompt and chunk pairs come directly from the subject matter experts. Um, we often leverage those as ground truth for evaluating the retrieval process. We don't want to use anything that's synthetic. We want to know that if a retrieval process is going to work well, we can measure that on something that a, a subject matter expert is actually validated. Uh, these programmatically created label prompt and chunk pairs, what we've innovated at the company, uses kind of weak rules of thumb and metadata to scalably create a larger training set um, that can be more robust and we can help fine tune to the most expected types of prompts. So, and I think Marty might um, showcase some of this in, in the platform. We offer this actually already um, in, in some of the customer projects that we've developed where you can go in and say, you know, overall, what would define a good chunk for a given question? This last piece, this synthetic prompt and chunk pairs are ones in which you take a, a pre-chunk document and you actually use a large language model to generate questions for those chunks. Um, so it's a very clever way of creating a high volume of training data that's used as standard practice in certain parts of the AI field. And what we found in practice is that this can help fine tune retrieval models for unexpected kinds of prompts, because it's a lot more general. You have a very broad based set of annotations or kind of chunks that you're creating questions for, and it's not restricted to something that a subject matter expert might've thought of ahead of time. What do you do once you have this training set? So you have these three components, manually labeled prompts and chunk pairs, programmatically generated, and then this purely synthetic process. What you do, you, you put them all together into one big training set, and you use a fine tuning algorithm to create your fine tuned embeddings. I won't get into the mechanics of the fine tuning algorithm today, just for time's sake. It's, it's somewhat inside baseball, um, but there are APIs that allow this fine tuning algorithm um, to operate uh, pr pretty elegantly that are easy to use off the shelf. What do you get once you fine tune this embedding space? Well, as you may recall, on the left-hand side, in, in our you know, pre-trained embedding space, we we're kind of lumping together relevant from irrelevant chunk pairs. You know, there was no really good threshold for relevant scores that would be able to distinguish them. On the right-hand side, we're seeing the results of our fine-tuning process in which, as you can hopefully see, these two distributions are very clearly separated. Relevant chunks have pretty high scores on average. Irrelevant chunks have pretty low scores on average. And so we would, you know, in this case, have a threshold of maybe about 0.7, you know, any relevant score over 0.7, count that as a relevant chunk included in your context window. So I've, I've gone over the embedding algorithm for a bit. Hopefully, um, you know, you can see that that it, it's useful. Um, it makes sense to fine tune it. You, you can have better abilities to distinguish relevant from relevant chunks. Well, what do you do with those relevant scores? So, you know, that last video take home was embedding models matter to the success of retrieval model. Well, also you need to be able to use your relevant scores optimally um, because all we have so far is an embedding model that gives us scores. How do we turn that into a, a set of contextual signals that the large language model can learn or use for, for its task? So why is this important? Well, if we had a, a really liberal criteria for including chunks and say, well, anything over a really low relevant score include it, um, you know, again, we have this problem where we get a really noisy signal and also kind of slower large language models because they have too much information to wade through. Um, this is kind of similar to the trade-off that we saw with the chunking, where you know, if, if your scoring threshold is too high, if you're if you're too conservative and, and what you define as a relevant chunk, you actually have a risk of missing something that's really important. And for those of you, you who are familiar with kind of precision versus recall decisions and classification problems, it's it's um, very analogous. So how do we navigate this trade-off between what's effectively precision and recall? What we've uh, figured out in the research team is how to use chunks based on ranked relevant scores and the size of the context window. We'll get into a lot of the details right now, um, but here's a, just a cartoon representation of, of how it works and the, and the customer problems that we've helped solve. On the left-hand side, um, you see what's usually done by default in some of these um, off-the-shelf APIs that do rag for you, where there's just some fixed number. Take like the top three chunks in terms of score and just include those. And what I'm showing here on the left-hand side, every blue chunk here in this cartoon is relevant. Um, if you just pick the top three, you miss these two down here. And you've also underutilized your large language model context window. Whereas if you use a more optimal algorithm that's based not just on um, you know, a top three or the window size itself, but also on the relevant scores, you're more assured of using every blue chunk here, every chunk that's relevant. That's kind of the basic idea is 
um, it's, a, it's a scoring algorithm that allows you to fill up your context window with as many chunks that you think are relevant and no more. Just to sum up, I, I, I've gone over basic pieces of this pipeline, um, you know, splitting, uh, chunking optimally. We, you know, we have a proprietary algorithm that does this pretty naturally, classification and information extraction algorithms that let us uh, you know, create metadata that can in turn be used to training our embedding models as well directly in the retrieval process. And then we talked about the retrieval model itself. How does it use embeddings to compute relevant scores? And, and how do we leverage these scores to actually feed the right signal to the, the context window for the large language model? Um, and so again, just to recap, hopefully what you've seen today is that the whole pipeline matters and that you wanna optimize each piece, of, each piece of this pipeline. You can really get pretty dramatic improvements and, and the performance of your RAG system if you really focus on the entire pipeline as a system and not just you know, the parts that are machine learning based such as, such as the embedding model. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll take it over to you, Marty, who's gonna demo some of, uh, some of this in action using our, our platform. Great, thanks. As a brief reintroduction, uh, my name is Marty. I'm on the product team leading some of our efforts around generative AI evaluation and development workflows inside of our platform, Snorkel Flow. Uh, at Snorkel, we're very focused on taking leading research and putting it into our product so that our customers can benefit from, you know, tuning workflows, whether it's focused on the LLM or upstream retrieval. And I want to anchor us on this diagram, uh, which is uh, an accurate representation today of how most of our customers are thinking about building generative AI systems. Some unstructured data goes into a vector database represented by an embedding model and at inference time or generation time, when a user asks a question of their co-pilot or their document Q&A system, uh, the relevant context is retrieved, injected into the context of the large language model, and then the large language model generates a response. And at Snorkel, we really see the, um, the development cycle fitting into two different components of the same system. And each component needs to be tuned, evaluated, and developed um, kind of in isolation while holding the other constant. And so today we're gonna to focus on identifying retrieval errors and doing things in our product snorkel flow to directly address those retrieval errors. So tuning RAG in snorkel follows a five step process. And I'm gonna demonstrate each of these steps today. We'll start by evaluating an existing Gen AI pipeline. Uh, we'll assess it for production quality. And if we're in the instance where we're, we're not meeting the production bar, we're going to identify those targeted error buckets, those issues in our data where we need to go directly address, um, whether that's fine tuning an embedding model, addressing our chunking algorithm or developing metadata models to better index our chunks. Uh, we'll actually conduct that model training, that fine tuning inside the snorkel, and then we'll reevaluate the pipeline. And we simply go through this loop, this iterative loop in our product over and over and over again until we reach that production quality bar. So for the demo today, we're working at Shield Healthcare and we're building a co-pilot over health insurance policy documents. Um, these policy, the, this co-pilot is designed to save our customer service agents time to automatically generate answers when customers have questions about comparisons between policies or information about out-of-pocket coverage. Um, and we're gonna actually start in our pre-production environment where we're noticing some odd behavior with, uh, with the existing version of the co-pilot. Uh, I'll start by asking a relatively straightforward question, comparing maybe the, the, me the medical deductibles between First Data and Dow Humana. And as a domain expert, I know that this co-pilot needs to be grounded and provide very clear, direct, dollar amount information for a lot of the questions that I anticipate that my customers are gonna ask. This looks pretty good. Um, let me ask maybe something a little bit more complex or a little bit more specific about an out of test or out of, net, out of network eye test. Well, it looks like here I'm seeing that, you know, the large language model or the co-pilot's responding, but it's not being specific as to, you know, the actual amount that that's gonna cost. Lastly, I'll ask a, a more specific question about, you know, a, a coverage for a specific procedure. And it looks like, um, you know, this policy document doesn't actually contain information around colonoscopies. However, I know as a domain expert that it almost certainly does. So I have some intuition that there's a problem here, but I need to go one step deeper. So we'll start by onboarding a, a subset of our data into Snorkel Flow, and we'll actually tag our domain experts to help us evaluate the quality of the large language model and the quality of the retrieve context. 
Now you're seeing on the right-hand side, a very simple thumbs up, thumbs down for the quality of the LLM, the quality of the RAG. However, you can imagine that this label schema and, and the things you want to evaluate uh, can be fully customizable. We find that uh, a combination of domain expert input with sort of uh, LLM as judge input can be a very strong kind of combination to properly evaluate your system. But as a domain expert, I'd log into Snorkel. I'm presented with a very simple view of my data and I'm able to provide feedback. So in this example, uh, somebody's asking about eligibility criteria and the large language models failing to abstain. So that's a rejection. If I look at the retrieve context, I can see that also this retrieve context um, is, uh, is actually correct. So this is an instance where our retrieval is doing a good job, but our large language model is, uh, is not. So this would be fall into that bucket of generation error. Maybe moving on to my next example, um, I can see that, again, I'm, I'm abstaining from answering, so that's a rejection. Um, but then when I look at the retrieve context, it looks like we don't actually have the information that we would need uh, to properly answer this question. So in Snorkel, I'm actually going to reject this as well. And I go through a representative subset of my data. Maybe I can tag different data points. You know, A common error mode that I might see is that our retrieve context is pulling back from the table of contents, which usually isn't going to be helpful for, for a co-pilot solution. I can, as a domain expert, add questions uh, or comments back to my data scientists or machine learning engineers to let them know about you know, any oddities in the data that I see. At Snorkel, generally, we find that a single platform in which our domain experts and our data scientists can partner on building a use case uh, greatly expedites the ability to improve the quality of these solutions. All right, so maybe I've labeled 50, 60 examples. And now I, I want to look at kind of the solution at, at, at large. And I can see very quickly that based off of my domain expert feedback, which probably took, I don't know, an hour, hour and a half, I can see that 55% of the time, my retrieval algorithm is properly um, you know, re returning the right context for a given instruction. However, about 45% of the time, um, it's not. So clearly I have a problem and I need to develop and improve and enrich my RAG solution in order to um, you know, get it to production quality. I mean, I think everybody on this call can, can intuit that if your retrieval algorithm is not returning the proper context to your large language model, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, the large language model is unlikely to be able to respond correctly. But I'm going to highlight three techniques here that we leverage in our platform in Snorkel to enrich a RAG pipeline. The first will be document chunking. The second will be document enrichment via metadata models. And the last piece will be embedding model fine tuning. So optimal chunking and snorkel. Well, let's start to actually look at these documents and understand that the way that they're chunked. If we use something like Llama Index or LangChain, we might implement a, a static chunking al algorithm with a little bit of overlap. And if we do that, our chunks start to look like this. And you can see why um, maybe different sections are included in one or multiple chunks, and we're losing some of the logical information that's encapsulated in the document. Well, at Snorkel, we have a, a dynamic chunking algorithm that, that Chris uh, referred to that captures semantic information as well as rich document you know, information like section headers, uh, bullet points, tables of contents, and tables, and allows you to more accurately kind of uh, chunk documents into a, a single logical portion. So when we use the same exact, we look at the same exact document using Snorkel's dynamic chunker, we're able to see that we're capturing each section logically in its own separate chunk. Um, and then we we simply, we use this chunking algorithm in conjunction with our larger LLM orchestration technology to actually create more accurate, you know, chunks for our data that are fed into, into the vector database. So that's our first technique. Our second technique here is building document enrichment models. So the intuition behind these is that when we can tag various figures or sections in a document with topics, so in this example, maybe annual deductible or coverage limit, um, then we can use that metadata to uh, optimize the search and retrieval space at, at inference time. So in Snorkel, we can do that a couple of different ways, um, but our whole process relies on this concept of programmatic labeling. So instead of trying to build a model to find relevant pieces of information in a document and just asking a domain expert to label these pieces one by one by one, we can instead use Snorkel to write labeling functions rules to label a large amount of our data very quickly, 
and in doing so, um, generate a lot of training data that can be used to, to power these, these metadata enrichment models and build them much, much faster. In our work with customers, we've been able to build these metadata models on the order of you know, half a day or a day, as opposed to a couple weeks or months uh, that it would have taken them otherwise by their own estimate. So when building these metadata models, one of the things that we could consider is, why don't we use prompts to help us identify things like coverage limit, annual deductible, percentage of in-network and out-of-network cost. These are the things that we, knowing this use case a little bit more, we know are the important things to identify before putting, before chunking our data and putting it into the database. So we can write prompts in Snorkel to label our data. Um, but what we find when we simply rely on prompts alone is that our model performance is, is a little too low. And so Snorkel is, uh, you know, with Snorkel, we can not only use prompts to programmatically label our data to train these metadata models, but we can also direct directly inject more direct kind of domain expert signal into, into the solution. So another labeling function that you're seeing here is, for example, if I see uh, HDHP in the title um, within two words, I want to label that, uh, that span as annual deductible. So again, what we're doing here is we're building a model to tag different sections of our document and specifically numerical figures with the value uh, uh, that that numerical figure corresponds to. With Snorkel, we can do this far faster than alternatives, um, and we can do it more accurately by relying on both you know, large language model prompts, but then also direct subject matter expertise through these labeling functions. So after we've built these metadata models, they can be injected into our existing pipeline to tag different sections of the document with metadata, and then that metadata can be used um, further downstream in the retrieval process. The last thing that I'll highlight, because I want to save time for questions, I'm sure there are a lot, are the techniques that we offer in Snorkel to create a rich training set for fine-tuning an embedding model. So Chris highlighted this before, but really quickly. The recipe for creating this data set in Snorkel consists of three parts. Uh, the first is what, what I like to call an open book exam, where we ask our domain experts to log into Snorkel and help us, for a given question, find the relevant pieces of information that they themselves would need to answer this question. We can then use a small amount of this data as, an, as sort of an inspiration for writing labeling functions in our platform to say, hey, for this other question that the domain expert didn't look at, how would we go and programmatically find the relevant chunks, right? And then the last recipe is using a large language model to look at a given chunk and infer a question or set of questions from that chunk. So this is the question context uh, data set recipe that we would use to fine tune an embedding model. So when we do this on this data set, um, I'll, I'll demonstrate the first and the third technique here, um, but you can imagine a domain expert logging into Snorkel and on the right hand side, they're presented with a small subset of questions that they would be expected to, to help us find. And maybe we'll zero in on this dental copay increase after $2,000 spend. As somebody who reads these policy documents and has to respond to these questions every day, I know that I'm gonna to go to my table of contents and then I'm probably gonna go look at med the medical benefits section on page 31. I can hop over there and really quickly find the relevant sections of this document uh, that correspond to this question. I can label this information. This information can then be passed to the data science team to then go write labeling functions and train models to identify further examples of question context pairs. Now I combine all this data in Snorkel, I fine tune an embedding model. In this case, we simply fine tune BGE small and we use the, uh, I believe we use the Llama index. Yes, sentence transformers fine tune engine uh, from Llama index. And we can see basically what we're graphing here is like we did a cross validation exercise whereby we looked at, um, we trained on a subset of the data, we held out a subset of the data. And we can see that with our pre-trained embedding model on the top, uh, we're not we're kind of, everything's getting lumped together, right? Our irrelevant context and our relevant context are kind of getting about the same similarity score. Now, when we fine tune in our embedding model, what we see is we turn a lumper into a separator, right? And now our embedding model is, is much more easily able to adjudicate between, hey, an in, a question or a context or a section about in-network coverage is actually quite different than out-of-network coverage, a nuance that is often lost on pre-trained embedding models when uh, they're trained on sort of a larger corpus because they just sort of 
consider that all insurance related information and therefore those things are actually quite similar. But when we think about this in the context of the problem, those things are quite different. We So we take these techniques, right? We take these three techniques, this dynamic chunking algorithm, this these models to attach metadata to chunks and our fine tuning embedding model. And, and, and what do we get? Well, when we pop over back over to our enriched pipeline, let me go grab a couple of these questions. <clears throat> So previous questions where the model was either kind of providing generic information or perhaps it was abstaining from answering, because we were able to more accurately kind of index this system, we can see that, hey, we're actually providing a uh, $10 copayment uh, response, which is, which is directly what we want to see. And when we asked this question that was previously abstained by the large language model, it looks like it was able to find the relevant sections in the document to help answer this question. So it is covered by this part of the plan. Um, and, and as a domain expert, that that makes sense with um, my understanding of, of this plan and these benefits. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of insight into the tools that we're building into our product and our platform Snorkel Flow to help our customers enrich their RAG pipelines for their unstructured data. And before we go to Alex, there's one quick question, Marty. Someone asked, what is the UI you were using to present everything, including the Jupyter Notebook? Yep. So uh, great question. So the the kind of the eval UI that I was showing, uh, or sorry, the UI where I was typing in those questions was a simple Gradio environment. Everything else was Snorkel Flow, our platform. So where I was doing the labeling, the model training, the Jupyter Notebook, everything is attached in our Snorkel Flow platform. And it allows data scientists and subject matter experts to collaborate in a single place. Thanks. And Alex, you've got 60 seconds or so. But just to wrap again, I won't rehash kind of what I said at the beginning, but just as a quick summary, you know, number one, there's a bunch of tools in the toolkit uh, for tuning, not just LLMs, but LLM systems, which, you know, a, a critical component of which is is the uh, the retrieval system. Um, we went through some of those systems uh, or some of those uh, tools today, you know, chunking, uh, you know, kind of tagging and enrichment and indexing which has all sorts of forms. Someone mentioned knowledge graphs in the, in the, um, in the, the, uh, the, the Q and a really, it's just about, you know, moving beyond just a vectorized embedding to more structured representations. And that all, you know, we showed how, how labeling is a key part of that. And then actually tuning the embedding and retriever models, um, or re ranker models using labeled data, like Marty just wrapped up with. So those are some of the tools in the toolkit. Um, for getting uh, retrieval systems to work. If you you know walk away with nothing else, again, I like Chris's you know high level points that he highlighted in his uh, great session. You know, number one, all parts of this pipeline matter, and number two, they can be optimized, and they often need to be um, to get to the performance bar you're trying to hit, especially on your unique use case, your unique data, and your unique domain. And I'd add a third, which I think should be obvious, but you know, labeled curated data is really the key to a lot of that optimization. Um, and we're here to help if you're interested. But at very least, hopefully the perspective shared was uh, was useful for what all of you are building out there. We'd love to follow up. Please reach out if you want to talk further. And we'll formally wrap there. Uh, and with that, let's jump into an extended Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Uh, Thea Sen, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm uh, mispronouncing your name, but you know, asked this question here about knowledge graphs. Okay, I, I hadn't been following the marketing uh, copy of some of these uh, knowledge graph uh, companies, but of uh, you know, uh, apparently they're saying rag without knowledge graphs is 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 dumb as hell. Um, we we use slightly softer terminology. Again, we're a little bit more neutral uh, as a you know, uh, knowledge graphs, structured databases, unstructured. Uh, what I would say is that um, you know. The idea of using knowledge graphs in RAG is really just part of this broader idea that not everything needs to be or probably should be just a vector embedding. And that, in fact, by better structuring your data before it's passed into a retrieval augmented generation system, you can get better results more robustly, more cost effectively, more uh, inspectably. Um, so if you think about how to do that structuring or tagging indexing of data, you know, Chris uh, and Marty both briefly touched on some of the kind of uh, tagging and labeling uh, work that we're doing to support that. Um, that is mostly just to populate some structured metadata. You know, you could do a more advanced form of that extraction, uh, which we've also supported in the past, and form an actual knowledge graph. But 
ignoring knowledge graphs specifically, the bigger idea is saying that, you know, we're seeing a lot of hybrid systems where the data is being um, both embedded as a vector embedded, embedding, but also structured data, tags, classifications, or even, you know, entity and relationship graphs are being extracted in advance using data labeling techniques like the ones Marty showed to make the indexing and retrieval more accurate and and uh, and and faster and cheaper. So big umbrella that kind of falls under that bucket of pre-tagging and indexing the data. And then one of the ways you could pre-tag and index is as a knowledge graph as kind of a subtype there. And given the fact that we don't work for a knowledge graph company um, and are kind of neutral to all these techniques, I would say, you know, use use data and use error analysis to find the best tool for the job. In other words, I would use data to to and, and use error analysis to understand is my you know first of all is my LLM system making a mistake because of retrieval or because of a generation error that's not related to retrieval right if it's the latter you know we and you know we have a lot of stuff to say there but in general you know you can do tuning there if it's a retrieval error does it seem to be a retrieval error that has to do with a complex kind of set of entities or relationships. If that is the case, then maybe pre-extracting a knowledge graph and adding that into your RAG system, which we can also help with in terms of you know, labeling and tagging the data to populate that knowledge graph might be the answer. But it might be a simpler approach, like one of the other tools in the toolkit that we presented today um, as well.